you know, and I, I don't know if it's necessarily as uncommon uh, being in this group of great restaurateurs here right now, but I think that the key that everyone holds true is, uh, you know, uh, give a shit, care about others, uh, whether it's your vendors, your third party delivery drivers, your staff, your guests, um, just give a shit and care about people and do what you can to lift others up and it'll come back to you ten, tenfold. This episode is brought to you by Restaurant Systems Pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest owner of Urban Hot Dog and Fat Frank's, Matthew Burnaby. My man, Matt, are you feeling unstoppable today? I'm feeling unstoppable. Dude, psyched to have you here. Um, so you are one of, the, I, I know I met you, actually, you've been listening to the show now. When did you, we first connect? How, take me back to that. Man, I think I've been listening. Pull since, that mic closer. I think I've been listening since 2013, 2014. Yeah. I mean, super essentially you know the last 10 years yeah man thank you so much for all of your support and uh i love connecting with people who have listened to the show and, and knowing when the show has has helped them and um it's like the biggest reward for me man so thank you for, for letting me know that you've listened to the show and uh, we recently reconnected i think you reached out to me as, just as a listener at one point because i do remember you uh and then most recently you, you started working with restaurant assistance pro uh, we reconnected through restaurant assistance pro with because uh, Fred Langley just basically said you, mm-hmm. he's just so impressed by what you're doing. Uh, you're, you're scaling right now. Uh, you're you're. I think I can't remember the numbers, but he said that you you move the needle on your prof or your 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 pr- profit. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean we we brought my my prime cost down. Uh, you know I think five percent, uh, which is massive yeah, in the restaurant. And, you know awesome. any percent it's big, but five percent is just crazy nice, on that prime dude. cost. Nice. I can't wait to pull back the layers on that. But before we dive into who you are and how you got to where you are today. Let's get that motivational, inspirational, ball rolling with a success success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Yeah, uh, you know, something that I kind of live my life by and, you know, the way I operate my restaurants is uh, a, a high tide raises all ships. Yes. And, uh, you know, to me, that just is all encompassing, uh, you know, whether you're uh, a dishwasher or a, an owner operator, yep. you know, do everything you can uh, to help those around you succeed, you know, more competition coming in and doing well helps you do better absolutely, um, and it, it just benefits the whole industry and and everyone around you yeah the, 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 there's a sentiment going around right now and i think it's happening where the, there is a change happening where we're not no longer looking at the people the guy the gal down the street as competition and more as a community of like hey like if we can lean on each other if we can share information if, if i can pick you up when you're down if you can pick me up when i'm down with if i run out of flour you know you got my back if you run out of flour i got your back exactly like, this is i this 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 and this end game where the, the mission isn't to win, but it's to make the community better. And I think that's happening. Are you seeing that right now? Oh, def- I mean, and you hit the nail on the head community. I yeah. think that's, uh, especially with everything that's happened the, the last few years, community is is what you kind of need to to survive and continue to to not only do well profitability-wise, but just well mentally and, and physically. I think it's the shift that's, you're, you're seeing this in the restaurant industry, and it's, it's my hope that this ripples out to the masses, to all industry, to world leadership. I mean, it's crazy we live in the world, it's 2023, or 2024 actually, as we're recording this, (laughs) happy new year. Um, And I I feel like the government, like we're still trying to figure out how to beat China. You know what I mean? Like why can't we just think about like, hey, like I can be in China in 24 hours. Like how can we start like working with different nations and just like thinking to ourselves like, like, there's some things around the corner like AI that we just don't know how this is gonna unfold. And instead of trying to like beat the other guy at being better at AI, like how do we just like work together to com- like combine our forces and like find a better future yeah. for everybody? Like yeah, what's going through better your mind? on that yeah. global community. Um, I think this restaurant industry can like influence yeah. at that level. I really do. What, what, do you believe that? Oh, I, you know, I think as restaurants go, the the rest of the world goes. I mean, this is where you're you're talking about politics. This is where do people go to share ideas? You know, right. pubs, bars, restaurants. And uh, if, if the restaurants are working together and, and you can see that in their team, you know, maybe that inspires everyone else to do the same. And, and the person that's your server today might be the person that's your senator or maybe even the president yeah. moving forward. Yeah. And the thing that's super exciting about the, the world we live in, like one of the few things I do like about social media is that we can we can move inspiration faster than ever before. Uh, like it's so easy to influence today and to have a voice and to to lift up other people. So it's it's an exciting time, man. Now, I think that was a really great way to start today's conversation. So 
where does it make sense to start sharing your story? Like when, when did you know this is what you wanted to do? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good question. I've always been really into entrepreneurship, uh, and, and growth. And my parents instilled that to me at, at a young age. I'm the, uh, the baby of four, uh, oh, you know, my, my brothers and sisters are anywhere from eight to 10 years older than me. So I was kind of the surprise baby. So I, I got to grow up, uh, you know, kind of doing my own thing. And part of that, you know, I used to, we had cherry trees in the backyard. I'd pick those cherries and I'd go door to door to sell them. I used to, uh, you know, modify Xbox consoles, the original Xbox. I put a little mod chip on there and I could sell it to uh, different classmates and certain things like that. Eventually, uh, I grew up a little bit and started doing some other things, forging and selling report cards. Oh, cool. Uh, you know, getting in trouble at school. Uh, you know, I, don't always, know why I thought that was cool, but yeah, I did. You know, I thought it was cool at it's the time. Creative, the school man. administrators did not uh, enjoy that as much. <laughs> and uh, so always been a little bit of a, uh, you know, an entrepreneur or, you know, a, a salesman in that sense. And uh, restaurants, I just, I fell in love with them. My uncle had a Italian restaurant, you know, coming from an Italian background, having those big meals you know, that was a good time for the family to, to come together and uh, be with each other and, and just really break bread, have some good drinks. You know, Italian sodas are one of my favorite memories, walking into my uncle's restaurant, getting that Italian soda with the whipped cream. And the uncles would come around and, you know, steal a little bit of yeah. your whipped cream and test it for poison, <laughs> you know, sort of thing is their little tax. And, uh, you know, I just I fell in love with it at a young age and didn't know if that's necessarily what I wanted to do. But I, I the feelings that I had at that nice. age just kind of resonated. Nice. And did you grow up in Albuquerque? Is I this did. Or this is all happening in Albuquerque? Yeah, born and raised in Albuquerque, okay. New Mexico. We should say thank you. I, I meant to mention this. We're actually, as we're recording this, we're in Washington, D.C., or just outside of Reston, I believe is the name of the town we're in, uh, Virginia. Uh, we are at Gregorio's Trattoria. Uh, and we are at the Restaurant Systems Pro Mastermind Elite Meetup, which is a quarterly thing that they do, which is really great. And uh, we're going to be talking to, to Greg Kahn tomorrow, but Greg is letting Fantastic. us use his restaurant. And I just wanted to give him a little nut. So we're recording this in D.C., but you you and your businesses are in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That is correct. Yeah. Got it. Um, so... <clears throat> When, so when did you start like working in the restaurant industry? Like, when did you know that like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Yeah. So I, as I, I mentioned, I, you know, I had older brothers and sisters and, and they were all working at a, a fine dining restaurant in Albuquerque that was on top of our Sandia Mountains. So you had to take a, a 15 minute tram ride to get up to that restaurant every day. And uh, I was looking for a job. I think I was 14 and a half, you know, just whatever the legal age may be. And uh, they said, oh, you, why don't you come work with us? I was terrified because I'm scared of heights and the fact that they had to go up and down that tram an extra 3,000, 4,000 feet every day was a little bit daunting. But uh, I, I got in there, started as a host, a dishwasher, a busser. And I mean, I caught the bug like that. Uh, you know, the, the chaos of the kitchens, the camaraderie. And I, I don't think I had a chance, looking back on it, to, to do anything else. I just immediately fell in love with the people I was yeah. working with and and just the nonstop fast pace. Yeah, you're pr likely hanging out with a bunch of people that forged their report cards at one point. <laughs> you, know, you just clicked. I get it. Like yeah. That's why I liked it too. Could have been my clients for <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> um, so, so you go to school, right? Albuquerque, New Mexico. I can't remember. It was in New Mexico, right? Yeah. Um, how old were you? When you first started working, I think you mentioned it was 14, 13 years old, you said? I, I think 14 and a half, 15, whatever the... Okay, you you're know, in the, high school doing this. Uh, middle, uh, yeah, high school, early high school, ninth grade, I think. Okay, and then um, you end up going to school for... So I, uh, of course, through selling report cards, ended up getting kicked out of uh, the school that all my brothers and sisters went to. Oh, this to. Is, was this a, like a prep school? Yeah, this was a, a prep school. Okay, got it. And they didn't like that? Uh, they, they did not See, like I that. See, I think they should inspire you. I, and you're like, you know, this is the right idea. We just channel should, this It's not allowed. Else. Like, but this is good energy. Like, you're thinking, you're, you're finding us, you, you saw a problem. People got bad grades. You found a solution. Yeah. But this isn't the solution. I, I was just for. helping people, which is, you yeah. know, what you do in the restaurant. Like, I think that behavior should be encouraged that you're just like you're just an entrepreneur. It's like, it, it can be it can be groomed. though. It, it can. Uh, you know, and to their credit, they didn't just kick me out for that. You know, there were future. Oh, there's offenses, more stories. A little bit more to it. Um, you know that, you know, maybe we don't need to get into. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they they did give me a chance. I'll, I'll give them that. And I, I, I took a mile and. You know, through that experience, I, I had a, a soccer scholarship. It was my junior year and ended up getting kicked out of school my junior year. And that kind of reset 
my life. You know, I, I thought I was going to be this great soccer player and do all these great things. Didn't have to worry as much about school. And once I, I got, you know, kicked out, um, that was also around the time where I was looking for another job too. So that's when I transferred over, um, you know, did a couple of caterings, random jobs here and there and started working at a Chick-fil-A. Okay. Was just opening up. I think it was the second Chick-fil-A in the city at the time and got hired on there to uh, kind of run their kitchen, you know, worked my way through the ranks from, you know, base employee to, to kitchen manager. Okay. I want to go back to this college experience a little bit more um, because I think it's a commonality between people who work in this industry who don't seem to do well either like just academically or they get into trouble. They like to have too much fun. What was your struggle? Like what look, reflecting back at that time, like what was your, your challenge with school? You know, I just, I wasn't focused. I did well in the subjects I enjoyed, but when it came what were to those subjects? history, um, sciences, um, psychology, philosophy, yeah. but when it came to the hard numbers, the math and you know, something that required fractions, I still don't understand fractions to this day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, it was, it was just those little things that what was the point of learning those yeah. in my mind. And, uh, when I got to college, it was kind of the same thing. Let's just, you know, the restaurant lifestyle kind of lends itself to you're hanging out, you know, people that maybe 20 or 30 years your senior uh, and uh, you know, you already feel like an adult, even though you're not. So you're kind of going through that party phase a little bit. And uh, you know, I just, I didn't have the focus or the drive or the understanding what that education was going to do for me. Yeah. So you're a junior, what you're 20, 21 years old. Uh, junior in high school is when I got. Oh, up. okay. Yeah. And so you didn't never end up going to college. I ended up going to UNM, um, okay. you know, instead of this out of state university, university near mom, university of New Mexico. So, uh, ended up going there, going through my little party phase, and uh, you know that leads us into uh, opening of Urban Hot Dog Company, um, which was I think my also my junior year. So my junior year was a uh, you know in high school and college were both formative times for yeah. me. Yeah, so so four years passed basically. Yeah. So you're what 18, 17 years old. When, 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 how old were you when you opened Urban Hot Dog? Uh, or when you started working at Urban Hot Dog. When I started working, at, I was twenty one years old. When okay. We, opened up over you're, dri- you're drifting from that mic you nope. want to get right behind it there it's a big difference yeah. yeah as people start rolling in here you'll see why so i mean i think there must have been something that you learned with uh being at chick-fil-a though like i think what oh, like, a ton of things i mean chick-fil-a their their corporate standards their uh you know here's how you do a here's how you do b you know let's watch a video for 12 hours on how to bread the chicken how to greet the guests before you even set foot in the kitchen i mean you wonder why they're so busy and why they can get food out in certain times. I mean, it's that attention to detail. I mean, they pay you for 12 hours before you've even done anything. You're just sitting there watching a video and then they spend a lot of hands on time training you, um, in, in every aspect. And, and they answer a lot of the whys, which I think are important. Where you know? was Chick-fil-A in, in what was this like 2008 for you around that time? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 2008. Um, you know, they were still uh, growing in the New Mexico market, you know, I'm I'm not sure what they were doing across the country, but they were one of the largest and still are one of the largest privately owned businesses. Um, And I mean, the amount of volume that they do, the amount of employee retention that they do, it's just, it's amazing to this day. And they've, they've kept on that track. And how long did you work there? I worked there for three years. Three years. And when you came in, at what level were you? Base employee. Everyone kind of got brought on on that level and worked my way up to uh, a shift lead. You know, they bring in their trainers from across the country for the grand opening. And then those trainers select a few people that have maybe stepped up. And at this point, are you just like looking for a job or are you thinking like, I, this would be a great place to figure out, like go work for like one of these like really well-known and respected organizations and, and learn from the best or like what was going through your mind? You know, at that time it was, let's just get a job and Chick-fil-A, you know, I, I had a few options to what I was going to do, but Chick-fil-A seemed like the best place to work for me at the time. It wasn't necessarily intentional, but I just liked the environment and kind of what they offered. And it was new. It was, it was a what new like market, uh, just friendly. Um, you know, uh, after being in a, uh, local restaurant for a little while, the lack of structure, you know, um, in the local restaurant was kind of getting a little old. This had a bunch of structure to it. This had a, a map on how I could grow. I could be a manager, maybe, a, a regional manager, maybe grow up to be an operator. But you didn't know that when you applied, did you? 
they, they had all that on their website. Oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, which I think is important to have that map, Absolutely. that path of yeah. what you can do in the future. Absolutely. I mean, if you listen to the show, you know how important I think that is too. Why is that so important? It, it gives people that want to do something more the knowledge that they can do something more. You know you're not just going to be, you know, a, a cook or a dishwasher. If that's what you want to do, great. But if you have the, the need and the want to grow, here's the map. Here's the path yeah. in which you do that. This is the step-by-step process exactly. to, to grow with us. And um, this is this element right here is one thing. When I first started this podcast, I was very much about trying to empower the independent restaurant owner. And I still am to this day. There's actually a Chick-fil-A right behind your shoulder as we're talking, which is kind of weird. I was like... I thought I was imagining it for a second. Anyway, I, I digress. ADD kicking in hardcore right Love now. It. So, um, yeah, I, I was all about empowering the independent and, uh, and trying to find more like single unit or like multi unit to like five unit operators and like to empower those people and to, to sway the, the scales in, in the favor of these types of operations. And then the more I learned, the more I realized that if you want to create opportunity, if you want to create passive growth for people, like you need an organization that is growing. Uh, so like what, what's going on through your mind as I say that, you know, it's, that's one of the reasons why I, I want to continue to grow mm-hmm. my brand and do different restaurants yeah. is I have great employees and I don't want to lose them. Right. You know, I've encouraged them in my early years to go, Hey, go work at this restaurant because I can't provide that opportunity because I'm working in the restaurant all the time. Um, and now that I'm at the point where I feel like I can help people grow and mentor them a little bit. To me, it's, you know, I want to keep you guys. What opportunity can I present for you, which I think is important? Yeah. I mean, I think you can scale as a more boutique restaurant group, like your Thomas, like your, um, you know, Enlighten, what, what am I trying to say? Um, Union Square Hospitality mm-hmm. is your- Danny Meyer. Danny, yeah. Your, your um, you know, your Cameron Mitchell, Mitchell restaurants of the mm-hmm. group where they have multiple different types of concepts and they've scaled to 20, 30 locations and they might have like- 10, 15 concepts within those 30 locations. I think that's possible, but it's just way more complicated, you know? But anyway, I'm trying to like define the best of all these different worlds. Well, and I I always recommend anyone that wants to open up their own restaurant, go work in a corporate restaurant for a little while, at least see what you don't like. Yeah. You might learn more from that, but at the very least those training manuals, those booklets, they're going to serve you well. And just that, uh, the, you know, the specific skill set that it takes to organize those sort of booklets. I mean, I, that's not a skill set no. I had, you know, so I, I took all the information, all the pamphlets I could and help bring that into, you know, my own concepts. Yeah. So you started at the bottom with Chick-fil-A. Mm-hmm. Uh, where were you by the time you left? I was kitchen manager. And how long did it take you to go from, you know, new employee to kitchen manager? Uh, I think about a year, okay. year and a half. Okay. And were there steps along the way to get to kitchen manager? You know, I don't even know if that was a position at the time when we first opened up. I think it was just shift leads, at least in our location. So once that position opened up, uh, immediately I was thrust into it. Or for all I know, they opened it up just for me because I wanted to grow. I wanted to continue to grow and eventually become a store manager. Got it. So um, when you were at this kitchen manager level, like why leave? Like you, there, there is opportunity for growth beyond that. What happened? You know, and that's... This is one of the things about Chick-fil-A is it's very family oriented. Mm -hmm. Um, And in this specific Chick-fil-A, it was, you know, the owner had a a couple of kids that were running their own stores. I just didn't see a path for me to move forward with as their kids were growing up and moving into positions of management. It just kind of seemed like they were going to continue to promote their own kids, um, which I get, you know, I completely understand, but it didn't seem like it was viable for me to continue on that nepotism is interesting yeah uh because like i think it's in human nature like we want to we want to work hard to create opportunity for those closest to us of course why wouldn't you and like you can't argue that your children as they should be are a little more close to you than the people that you employ Mm -hmm. right so like I, i don't it's weird it's like i get it like it's only human nature uh, and that's why we work so hard and that's why we take risks so we can provide security to those who are close to us first. So like, I don't, what, what are your thoughts on nepotism? You know, I, I agree. It's, you know, as, as I grow up and I, I have kids, I'm going to want to give them a leg up at the same time. Uh, you know, it's also in the back of your mind, the best person for the job should get the job. Maybe right. it is your kid. Maybe it's someone else. If your kid else. sucks, you yeah. know, maybe think about how that might r- hurt your business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like take that into consideration. Yeah. Don't have sucky kids. I guess yeah. is the lesson from. 
Uh, so you felt like the, the, in, at this time it seemed like the writing was on the wall that the opportunity was going to go to those closest to the owner. Now, this, this core value of like helping family, is that like a, a Chick-fil-A universal thing? Like, Do they encourage that internally or, or you know, was that I, just the, at this location? I think they do specifically look for uh, nuclear families in their operators because that provides a lot of stability. Yeah. You know, if you have a lot of young people, I guess, you know, who maybe don't know what they're doing with their life, they may leave or not focus on the restaurant as much when they have kids because that might distract them a little bit. So if you do have that nuclear family already in place, uh, I can see it from a, a franchise or mindset of let's get people that are settled down a little bit, have a family that are going to be a little bit more rooted in the community too, which I think is important. If you yeah. have kids, uh, you're more likely to support other local charities and be more invested in your community as well. Got it. Um, any other lessons during this time at Chick-fil-A? Because I just know it's such a great organization. It's really well run. Arguably one of the most successful f franchises in the world. I, you know, I think that attention to detail and the biggest thing for me was second mile service is what they call it. So it's going that extra mile for the customer. You know, you walk a mile and then walk another mile for them. What would walk, that, how did that manifest? Uh, in, in everything you did, making sure you're sending out quality food, making sure the guest gets their food uh, in a, uh, a quick time frame, that you're walking the food out to them. If you see a weird you know, expression on their face when they're taking a bite of that sandwich, go ask them how everything is and be, yeah. and be direct about it. You know, is, is everything tasting all right? Is there something wrong with that sandwich instead of just can... Don't wait for them to say something. Exactly. Like be receptive An to all the sandwiches. Anticipate the needs. Yeah. yeah. Um, give me an example of a time that you went the second mile. Um, you know, one of, one of my favorite stories is uh, we did a... Uh, and, and they kind of empower you to do that as well. So we had a guest who did a to-go order, and they called the store. You know, the, the worst thing you can do when you get home is, oh, I'm missing a chicken sandwich. Well, uh, the manager at the time let me know that, hey, the kitchen messed this up. They forgot a chicken sandwich. Um, how do you want to take care of this? And they allowed me to handle that, which helped me grow a little bit. But I was like, where do they live? I can drive. I can take them that sandwich and uh, make sure that they're not, you know, that their whole family gets to eat together. Someone doesn't miss yeah. out. And so it was really nice to be empowered to be able to make that decision as a kitchen manager. But also, hey, you can leave the kitchen, take this guest their food. And when I showed up at the door with that chicken sandwich, I mean, that was game changing for them. You see their face light up. Oh, yeah. no one would ever do this for me. And I, I carried that with me. And I've done that in my restaurants, you know, especially with third party delivery. Sometimes they take the wrong food and I've driven out i've had my staff empowered them have the ability to go make their day bring this food to them yeah you hear a lot about impressions in marketing we, we, we want to we were looking to make impressions there is no social media thing you could do that would equal that type of impression you, you, that you can't you buy make, that yeah that is that how loyalty. you make a life customer mm -hmm. right there and that's the kind of stuff that i encourage people to do to I mean, that's that's how you create regulars right there. I love that. Great example. Thank you. So um, I think now is a good time to take a break to thank our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to talk about um, how you found yourself at Urban Hot Dog. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now, Restaurant Systems Pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems, increase your profit and find better work life balance all you have to do is click the link below we're back and uh and this is where we are i love i love interviewing younger people too because i feel like it's like i can go much like i don't have to cover as much ground <laughs> so we got like you know you're at this point in your career how old are you 21 when when you go to yeah, urban 2021 yeah 21 it's like 12 years ago yep not that not that long ago so we can go really deep uh so why so you, you told us why you were going to leave uh, Chick-fil-A. Um, did you have a plan when you were walking away from that or like what was what was the strategy? I did actually you know I I was kind of raised uh, you know uh, I, I was kind of that weird kid that read a lot of books also a lot of finance books uh, and my my brother and my family always taught me you don't leave a job unless you have another one lined up and uh, my brother was a banker and he knew this guy that was opening up a hot dog restaurant Dave Kleinfeld and you know um, hey, do you want to go help this guy open up a, a local hot dog restaurant? And in the back of my mind, I'm like, no, that's crazy. Chick-fil-A is corporate. They can pay me as much money as I want. Uh, you know, what's this local hot dog guy going to be able to pay me to, to help him open up a restaurant? 
And uh, so in the back of my head, I was like, no, nah, that's crazy. That's crazy. And then kind of slept on it a little bit. I thought, well, you know, if I want to open up my own restaurant, I need to see what it looks like, you know, someday. I can, I should do it on someone else's dime. Yeah. Learn what works, what doesn't. And, you know, if, even though I might take a pay cut or I might ruin my, uh, you know, my one year plan of making more money, make less money, but gain more knowledge in the meantime. Yeah, that, that's genius right there. I, I wish more young people would see it that way. Like, go make mistakes on somebody else's. Knowledge. Exactly. Go learn, like, and, and just to, to get that perspective, right? Um, so, when, like, when did you start really diving into like finance books? When was that like a thing for you? You know, my my, I've always been motivated by. Uh, you know, money, my allowance instead of for doing chores, which of course we had to do chores. Uh, my mom would pay me to read books and write book reports on the books. So uh, any sort of book, fantasy, Lord of the Rings, I was all over it. But once I ran through all those age appropriate books, she started giving me finance books like Dave Ramsey. And uh, thank you, mom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It set me up for success. And, you know, I, that's how I was able to move out, you know, when I was 17 and a half and wow. get my own apartment with some friends is, you know, I was doing budgets, uh, you know, and, and she sat there and, and helped me do the budgets. But a lot of it was reading these books. And to me, that's how I needed to learn. I needed to have an end goal. I want to move out. I need to learn about finance. Yeah. Yeah. Because you said you weren't good at math. So I was like, you're good at some math. Yeah, you're yeah. willing to learn some yeah, kind When of it math. comes to money, it's a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. Oh, that, that is a great lesson right there. Just like, encouraging your kids to learn the stuff early on. Because these are like, I didn't learn this stuff until honestly, until around the time I started the podcast. So I was like later in life, 26, 27 years old until I started to like, and like, I don't blame my parents, but like their uh, first, second generation, you know, like from like immigrant families that they just didn't know, you know, and like they work so hard to, to help give us opportunity. You well, know what I'm saying? And I think that's a failure a lot on the schools as well. Like you go over math, but you know, you maybe spend half a semester on a budget in politics, you know, what's, what's that going to do half a semester on how to set up your budget? You yeah. should be spending, you know, uh, a whole year or maybe start when you're in sixth grade. Here's how you start a budget. Here's how you start doing things and work on that for the next four years. So we're not sending people out at 18 who, who don't know how to manage their finances. Absolutely. Um, awesome advice. So you end up working with this gentleman. Uh, his name was, um, Dave, Dave. Yeah. And, um, you, you were telling yourself, I'm going to go learn. Uh, so you, at this point, you know, you want to open your own place. Did you know what you wanted to do at this point? Oh, I had no idea. I just, you know, it's kind of the romantic. Yeah. Who doesn't want to open up a restaurant? Right. They're fun. Uh, again, you have all these fun memories. When you go to celebrate a life event, you're going to a restaurant. Absolutely. So I think everyone falls in love and flirts with the idea at some point. Mm -hmm. So um, what was it like the early days? You, you start working with Dave. How did it go? You know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a workaholic and it was, it was great. All this new information. You know, when, when I interviewed with Dave, he asked me all these questions. Do you know how to set up an inventory? Do you know how to do a recipe costing card? I had no idea how to do any of those things. Chick-fil-A doesn't teach you those yeah. things because it's, you know, it's corporate. That's they, not. They did it like they have how big of a menu? Exactly. They did it once 30 years ago. And, they <laughs> and never, never need to do it again. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so he's asking me all these questions. And, uh, you know, I'm young and, you know, I'm taking the world by by the balls essentially I said yeah I can do all these things I had no idea so I'd go home and I'd research how to, how to do an inventory how to uh, do a recipe costing card you know kind of making it up as I went and uh, I don't know if he bought it necessarily at the time but he hired me so I guess he, he bought a little bit of it and uh, it's kind of fake it till you make it so he didn't himself know how to do these things he, he did he did oh, he but did. he was okay. wanting someone to be able you know he was he didn't want to teach he wanted to kind of like have you exactly he had a few other businesses you know he actually was a landlord of the building owned the property itself so um this was an opportunity for him to do a restaurant which he's fallen in love with the restaurant industry and his own property and hopefully this restaurant also pays him and his partner's rent was kind of the the idea behind it got it so um so they were real estate first this was just a way to kind of fill a void and uh, they decided to go with a hot dog concept. Exactly. Uh, and this is his first restaurant he ever owned? Correct. Okay. Um, and I think another important thing to point out, your mom, what she did by helping you, by by encouraging you to read and learn, like she gave you the skills to go out and figure out how to, to, to uh, figure out a new skill. Yeah. And the, apply it. The willingness to learn and, yeah. and the ability to research things you don't know. Where did you go to find out how to do inventory and recipe costing cards? You know, the internet. Uh, it was a lot of the resource, a lot of Googling. I think it was a uh, restaurant owner.com. I was assuming that was going to be the one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was, you know, this was in the day, you know, back forums, there was like a restaurant owner forum. People were selling, you know, 
setting up little Excel files, which you click on that link, you don't know what you're going to get, what you're downloading. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, you know, the, the wild west of the internet a little bit, but yeah, a, a ton sure. of information. As Jim well. Lab was a pioneer in that front mm -hmm. and it, it was, it's still around today. It's still available on uh, restaurantowner.com and it's a great place to go just to get the templates. It is. Yeah. Just to get the basics. If you, if I, mean, I would encourage you to invest in software, I think that there's the, the money that you put into a software is going to give you systems and processes that you can never try to recreate on your own. But if, if that's out of reach, I get that. Restaurantowner.com is a great resource. That's a, a great starting point. For yeah. me, I always need something written out to start. If, yeah. I, if it's not written out, I, I start thinking of all the what ifs. But if there's a little guideline, I can make make that my own real quick. But I need it on paper. Yeah. Um, so you, you find owner or restaurantowner.com. You start getting all these different templates and spreadsheets to, and, and the tutorials. You're teaching yourself how to do this stuff. What was it like? Uh, you know, it was... I was still in college at the time. You know, I, I was kind of known for having a little bit of the party house, still in that party phase. You know, I used to pay rent by hosting beer pong tournaments. And <laughs> so, you know, I'd, I'd have people over and, you know, we'd be partying till one, two in the morning. And then once everyone went home, I'd bring out my computer or my laptop and I'd start taking notes. Here's what I need to do. Be up till four or five in the morning, go to class at 8 a.m. If I'm lucky, maybe I don't show up to class, sleep in and then get back and focus on the restaurant. And um, what did you? What were you focusing on when you were in school? Uh, business. Okay, cool. So, um, what was the? At what point? Just kind of get get ahead a little bit. Like, when did you start taking over the, the reins of Urban Hot Dog? You know, and that's that's one thing Dave did really well. Um, whether it was intentional or not, was he let me run it like it was my own restaurant? Oh, that's cool. There was a, a chef he brought on to kind of be the GM, and in the first month, month and a half of us being open. Uh, asked me if I thought I'd be able to take over that role. And again, uh, I said yes, I probably shouldn't have, uh, but he saw something in me and, uh, you know, the, the GM wasn't necessarily uh, doing the work he said he was going to do. So uh, I, I took over that role within two months and immediately dropped out of college. Just started working 80 hour weeks and, and you know, I, I loved it. That is the best education, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I don't know if I agree that you need to go to school if you want to own restaurants, because really, at the end of the day, what's going to make you successful is your ability to do it and your ability to attract onto yourself other people to do it for you when you want to go focus on the next project. Exactly. Right? And, you know, I, I will I did go back and get my degree right before, you know, I ended up buying the restaurant yeah. out entirely. And it, it did help me with the accounting. Yeah. But, you know, I think you learn a lot more hands on. Um, and if you're willing to to put in the work and with all the resources out on the internet now, you don't need to pay for a, a full no. college, ex, you know, education. It's your, your money is going to be better spent elsewhere. Did Dave ever tell you why hot dogs? Yeah. So uh, no one was doing hot dogs at the time in Albuquerque. Uh, we had gourmet burger, you know, this was 2012. So New Mexico, a lot of people were doing gourmet burgers and Albuquerque didn't really have a gourmet hot dog spot. You know, there was big spots in Chicago, like hot dogs, uh, Portillo's and a few other places, but, Albuquerque didn't really have yeah. something that kind of fit that niche. And if you're going to do a restaurant, the idea was let's do something different. Right. Um, and I think the other thing, if we learn anything from Chick-fil-A is do one thing really well. Yep. And, and I think when you do one thing really well, you can take some kid that's a, you know, business major in college and say, can you handle hot dogs? Yeah. And you uh, know, can you steam, can st you handle steam steaming bun? buns? I know it's more than that. But, yeah. Uh, well, like, what, what, what are you thinking right now? You know, and that's that's exactly what it was, and that's kind of what made it successful. And, of course, 2012, I think, across the country, you could see it. A lot of restaurants were stopping the big menus, the massive menus, the one restaurant does it all, and, and really focusing. You had your Chick-fil-A's, your, uh, your Popeye's, your um, Shake Shack's. Let's just do one thing. Do it well. You can have a few other things, but focus on a smaller yeah. menu, make it efficient, and minimal labor on top of it as right. well. Um so what, what was the menu like back then? Like how, how many items were there? Do you remember? You know, I think we had about 15, 14 hot dogs on there. Uh, we had a few different sausages and just focused on hot dog sausages and fries. Okay. So hot dog, sausages, fries, 15 to 15 total so hot dogs, but like maybe what, 25 total products? Yes. So in yeah. that ballpark? What yeah. about today? Has it gone more or less? Um, today I've added quite a bit. You know, we do sliders. Uh, you know, I do a bunch of specials. I'll bring in fresh alligator fillets for Mardi Gras, oh, you know, kind of up the game a little bit still with a focus on hot dogs because that's kind of what we built yeah. the name brand on, but you know, expand it. So more people can come plant-based options, chicken. Right. Right. So, um, at what point did, 
did he start having this conversation with you of like, do you want to take this thing over? You know, I think it was about a, a year, a year and a half in the numbers weren't looking great on his end. He had put a ton of money. I mean, did a gorgeous build out, great branding. And, uh, you know, just, it, it was taking a lot more time and stress. And I could tell with the frequency of meetings we were having and looking at the P and L's, which he was very open about the books that, uh, you know, this might not be something that, uh, you know, without a massive change increase in sales, that's going to carry on to be a restaurant for a while. So I think he was looking for some outside, um, someone to purchase it from the outside. And someone actually did approach me one day and say, uh, hey, we're looking at buying, you know, Urban Hot Dog. Would you be interested in still managing it for us? And that kind of took me by surprise. You know, I, I had no idea it was that far along in the process. And I told Dave about it. And that really kind of frustrated him a little bit. So because did they go to Dave at all before going to you? I think they had talked to him. Okay. But they for sure did not have permission to kind of talk to the staff about what was happening. What was the, the frustration? So that was the frustration that he didn't have the permission to like make it note. Like exactly. Note the, exactly. The, yeah. So um, what when this happened, um, what, what went off in you where you're like, wait a second, maybe I can buy this? Like at this point, is that what you were thinking? Well, it, and that was my thought. I was like, man, I put my heart and soul to this. I dropped out of college to sell wieners, which uh, hot dogs, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, my parents did not love that. And uh, I don't think that's any parents dream to hear that. But, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time uh, focusing on this and I, I really thought I could make it profitable, but I, I needed it to be completely mine to make that happen. And through this kind of scenario, Dave said, well, why don't we work something out where you have some sweat equity and you can purchase this off me and, and really kind of mentored me to make it happen and give me the opportunity to do that when uh, I didn't have the financial ability to do so at the time. So, I mean, I love this. I mean, I, I love this. Uh, in, even a, a way to like, if you're somebody who likes to like you, to build, build brands, build businesses, uh, if that's like your jam, like how can you, what's your succession plan? Like, how mm -hmm. do you move on? Are you going to sell it? Like how can you create opportunity for the people that you're hiring? This is a way to create that opportunity, right? To give people like a vertical to grow and then say, you can have this someday. So how did you guys structure that? You know, and, and he made it super easy for me. It was you can buy this outright in five years if you want. We're going to do monthly payments as almost like a franchise fee to begin yeah. with because I didn't have a lot of capital. I was 21 at the time, uh, spending most of my money on kegs, you know, yeah. and, and things like that. So he made it super easy for me to get into there, taught me how to make my own LLC and uh, coached me on, you know, how to talk to an attorney, how to review these agreements. And he very easily could have taken advantage of me. Um, because I didn't know what I was doing. Say his last name for me again. Kleinfeld. Dave, Dave Kleinfeld. Kleinfeld. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, thanks, Dave. Dude, we need more Dave Kleinfeld. We do. Ways. This is the kind of stuff, like making the people around us better. Um, so uh, you said five years was the, the terms to, to pay the, the value of, the, what, how, what did you value it at? Like, what did he tell you that the, the, the value was back then? So it was the, the value of the brand, all the equipment, everything in there. I think we set that number at maybe 60000 60000 And you yep. already kind of pointed out that it wasn't necessarily making a ton of money. It yeah. wasn't like I, you're I think it was actually losing money right. every month. So um, really, you're just base, basically purchasing the brand and the equipment at that point. 60000 exactly. Over five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little more than five, um, a little more than 10000 a a year. I mean, that's pretty yeah. doable. Looking back on it, I was like, man, this is impossible. I can't do this. Uh, you know, at the time and now looking back and I'm like, man, that was nothing. Right. You know? <laughs> That's a what an opportunity. A little over 10,000 a yeah. year, but still. So like, w uh, what was like the, the monthly payment on? Like, I'm not going to math either. Clearly. Y you know, I think it was <laughs> maybe, uh, 1800 a month. Um, and if, if I ever hit a rough month, he'd say, Hey, you don't have to pay me back this month. We'll catch it next month. Yeah. And it, it was a win-win too, because he was also partners in the property and still is with my original location. Right. So he was looking for an opportunity to create cash flow in an asset that he already owned the mm -hmm. building. He wasn't getting it from the product. So he got it from the asset of the actual business, getting a paycheck from somebody. So like it, it, absolute win-win. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, what were your biggest challenges during this time of, of taking the, the reins? Well, one, one thing I wanted to make sure is that I went back and got my degree because I That's knew right. if the restaurant uh, continued to operate, I would not have any time to do that when it was my own. Right. So uh, I told him, hey, give me some time, go back, get my degree. Can we push off this purchase agreement a little bit? 
and he was more than happy to do so. Gave me a time limit, of course, because you you know he didn't want to spend the next five years of me trying to finish a degree. Right. So I took some accelerated courses, um, really focused in on the business aspect, the accounting, because I knew those were all things I didn't want to pay for. That was one of the things, you know, I saw that line item, maybe it was four or $500 a month he was paying to an accountant. I said, well, why don't I do that? Why can't I do the own accounting? Do you still think that way today? I, I did up until, you know, a few years ago yeah. when it was finally time to say, you know, I've, I've spent uh, too much time focusing. I know what my numbers are and what they need to be. And which was important for the first five years. I think people should do their yes. own accounting at some point to yeah. learn it. But also at how least do it, know it to, to be able to do it if you have to. Exactly. Yeah. So to double check and make sure yeah. things are correct. But now, it, you know, I need to focus on growth and making sure I'm providing value for my guests, for my, my staff. And I yeah. can't do that if I'm hunched over my computer trying to, you know, debit and credit certain accounts and little things like that. Yeah, there's a hard truth that you might just not have the budget to have an accountant. And mm-hmm. I get that. But as soon as you have... The oh, money. Please. Yeah, it's well worth the money if you find yeah, a good account. Yeah, like, let a professional do it. Like, I got into trouble personally um, with just, like, just taxes. Like, just making sure there's money set aside. To, like, like, that's not your money. Like, you know, like, you <laughs> that's can't. The government's going to want that back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, it, it's absolutely 100% worth, I, I, I think, having the accountant. But for sure, knowing how to do it on your own is so valuable. So, you went to school. You figured out how to do the basic stuff you need to know how to do to save money. Good on you, Scrappy. Um, what were the other challenges? You know, it was, since it was such a small operation, you know, at the end of the day, it is hot dogs. Yes, we're making toppings fresh and certain things. But it was, uh, you know, I had to learn how to uh, create a whole recipe book, how to menu engineering, all these sort of things that uh, I, I had no knowledge of. You know, my goal was always work at a couple of different restaurants, see what works, what doesn't. And again, let someone else pay for my training. Uh, but this opportunity, in my mind, was too good to pass, pass up. Oh, absolutely. So, um, again, where did you go for the, the, the figure out the recipe? Co- well, you already mentioned the recipe costing with um, oh, restaurantowner.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, recipe book, meaning just a, a collection of cost cards yeah uh and you know dave is kind of similar in me in that he likes to read information gatherers yeah. or you know what i i'll t- buy as many books as i can and maybe i'll read them someday maybe i won't maybe i'll sh- just sit on a shelf but one book he gave me as part of the uh the purchase was a, a book and i forget the author but it's restaurant success by the numbers oh yeah yeah and it's an accountant's view on what makes a successful restaurant it goes into detail of here's how you should do menu costing here's a brief overview on menu engineering here's even the height you should have your chairs at for your bar and how much you should spend on those chairs based off your revenue and so that was a a really great resource and i I probably read that cover to cover four or five times um just to make sure you know this is a big thing at 21 years old yeah i I don't want to screw this up um your podcast was very instrumental uh we would share your podcast between each other and and certain episodes, and and I, you know, I think I started at episode one uh, to get all the information you had with episode one, you know, and and work my way up from there. So your podcast was huge, instrumental, and in, in what I could do helped me from making mistakes that you know that would probably would have cost me a lot of money. Yeah, man, for sure. Thank you for letting me know. And um, uh, I mean, that's why, dude. That that's like the the biggest joy for me right there is hearing that. That w- that's what it was all about. You know, it's helping those people that were in the position to to chase their dreams. So I'm happy you found that value. So, um, as like, like paint the picture of where you are today, get big picture of where you are today. Um, when, where we are in the storyline, you're at one location, you're taking the reins over from Dave, uh, you're learning, you're growing. Um, where is it today? Yeah. So today, uh, we're been open for 13 years at this point. Um, I just opened up six months ago, a brand new location. I ended up purchasing the building doing a big remodel on this new location. It's kind of in a historic part of, of, of Albuquerque there. So the brand new location you purchased the building? Yeah, purchased the building. Did you already own the building from Dave from your original location, or does Dave still own that? He still owns that okay, one. Yeah, still leasing that out. This opportunity just kind of uh, fell in my lap. A, you know, gorgeous building built in 1942, a bunch of, bunch of history to it. And I went to go lease it out, and Dave was my mentor in, in, in this one too and, and helped me as a, the broker for it. And uh, the lease didn't make sense at the time. So I went back and forth with Dave and, and the owners and uh, it just didn't seem like a good fit. So we walked away and then I just sent Dave a message one day and I said, what, what if we bought the building? And, uh, you know, I, I didn't necessarily have the money to buy the building at the time, but yeah. I was like, let's just put it out in the universe and That's see what world, happens. Right? 
and uh, they they said, you know, we'll give it some thought, and they actually agreed to sell the building. So then it was a mad scramble to kind of figure out financing and yep. a construction plan, and uh, it, it ended up working out. You were able to open up a restaurant with a full liquor license, which is was exciting. Uh, downstairs, it had a, a great spot, so we actually put in a full kitchen down there, as well as a speakeasy, a hidden bar called Fat Frank's. That's kind of a cocktails for a cause uh, kind of concept behind it. So Fat Frank's is below uh, the Urban Hot Dog location. Correct. Okay, Yeah. Cool. So you enter in through a back alley, and to make a delivery to Fat Frank's, which is a reservation, you agree to bring uh, a, you know, a, a canned good in this instance. We pair up with different charities, but oh, it's... Cool. Uh, part of your cover charge to get in is you donate to charity. Nice. I love that. Um, and how long has that one been going on? Uh, we opened that in September. So we're at four months, I think, oh, there. Congratulations. Thank you. Looks, how's it going early Oh, on? fantastic. Nice. It's amazing. Nice. We'll get there. I think we'll, we'll unpackage that a little bit more. So you have the, the two locations, the original. You, you bought the second location. You own the property at the second location. You, you, you built out a, a new concept in the basement in the second location. You also have a food truck. Yeah, uh, I have a food truck. And do a bunch of caterings with that weddings you know our tagline is our dogs like to party yeah you know so any event in which you want to party our hot dogs would be there nice i love that and um you also had other locations before the pandemic too is that I right? did, I, yeah i picked the worst time to expand oh, okay uh you know i think december 19th of 2019 is when i opened up a, a brand new location and a second food truck and, you know, uh, pandemic hit March 17th and everything was shut down. So in 2019, you had two brick and mortar locations. And two food and, trucks. And two food trucks. Yep. So four units. Um, and when did you open the second location? The first second location. The first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets confusing that way. Uh, that was March or December 19th, 2019. Okay. okay so yep. that you would. So the second, the first second location. Okay was December 19th. So yep. you opened your first location in 2012. So seven years passed between the first location and the second location. So let's talk about that time between first location and second, first, second location. <laughs> <laughs> so during that seven year period, like what was your growth? Like what were your challenges for during that first seven years? You know, the first year I, I promised myself I wouldn't take a day off until I had a profitable month. Um, which probably wasn't good or healthy, but I was bootstrapping it. So yeah. I, I think three and a half months in uh, was the first day I was able to take a, a Monday off. So you started working with him, Dave, in 2012. Yeah, after the purchase. Okay. After I officially purchased it, you know, I think this was 2014. Okay, 2014. So is, you, yeah. you had two years of working with him before you took over the race. Yeah. So in 2014 is when you were really like the the owner of this place. Exactly. Uh, and th that's when you're having this narrative. I'm not going to take a day off until I'm profitable. Mm -hmm. So you had ba basically like a, a five year run from going from not profitable to profitable and scaling. So when did the, when did the needle start to move? How long did it take? You know, after that first year, I was able to actually look at the numbers and, uh, doing my own accounting. Uh, you know, I, I saw, you know, the monthly growth, how I was able to cut labor, cut all these costs, renegotiate rates with my my vendors i mean i sat there with a spreadsheet and i cost out every you know how many what's my dollar amount per a hot dog what's my dollar amount per bun and spent a lot of time uh every month doing that and tracking you know what's going up this month what's going down next month and really uh you know focusing on things that i could control because i felt like i couldn't control people walking through the doors at that time. This is where all that energy to learn accounting really served you. It's Ex not necessarily yeah. about how much money is coming in. It's mm -hmm. about how can I also control the money going out, right? So how, was it a challenge for you to, to, to cut costs without sacrificing value? Um, you know, it wasn't because I was there all the time and, and people kind of knew me. And, it, and I think it started to grow more once people found out that I was the owner. Okay. Um, you Why know, did that matter? You know, they, they saw me there all the time. They mm -hmm. knew me. They saw my dedication. They you went the two miles. Yeah, over I, I did. And yeah. Over and over. <laughs> I, you and know, over. I slept there certain nights. Yeah. And, you know, the dedication to consistency and quality. And, you know, honestly, I think a lot of them just wanted to see a kid succeed. Yeah. On top of it. I, I mean, I should have probably asked you this before we started recording, but how comfortable are you talking about numbers? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah. What, like what, what, we, per, we could dig in what percent profit were you at this point? Like you're zero. Were you, were you still losing money? I wasn't losing money, but you were, you know, like what percent profit? Like 1%? I, you know, I think my salary when I worked for Dave was around like 
thirty-six thousand a year. Okay. Um, so when you bought it, that was money that you got to got, get back, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So my goal was at least let's at least pay myself thirty thousand a year. Okay. You know, I can survive off that, and I can live off hot dogs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which I did. With breakfast, lunch, I and dinner. I saw something on social media recently. And somebody took this challenge where they ate nothing about like Costco hot dogs, like at the Costco, and they like ended up losing a bunch of weight. Yeah. Well, losing. yeah. Look, maybe that's my problem. <laughs> I ate too many hot dogs. Uh, uh, okay, so like, so you 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 get like this thirty thousand uh, dollar, basically like, your your business gets to recoup that because it's not going to an employee mm-hmm. anymore. That's huge. Um, you're 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 not really profitable yet at this point. But when did you start? Like, so just constantly like people developing these relationships is what I'm hearing. People wanting to support you, knowing that you're the owner. Take it from there. Yeah, uh, and you know, people were finding ways to you know essentially give me their money because they wanted to see me succeed so like Mm. hey we have this event going i didn't have a food truck at the time can you come you know cook on our grill um and i was sure i I said yes to everything at the time uh you know whether it was uh cooking on their grill cooking in their kitchen bringing my hot dogs to them whatever i can make happen i was like this is another avenue for growth yeah i can learn so much for this ended up buying a little blackstone griddle and doing a bunch of caterings that way so you know i think that first year um, after I purchased it, I ended up maybe sixty thousand dollars profit. Oh wow! Yeah. So you basically doubled your profit right off your, the bat. Your income yeah. for you off the bat in the first year. That's awesome. Um, so as time's going on, like how, like what were the, the challenges you were hitting along the way? After so that was the first year. You go from thirty thousand to sixty thousand. You're still the only employee. Uh, we had employees. I probably had four or five employees. Okay. You know, uh, but I was still working nonstop eighty hour work weeks. Got it. Uh, you know, missing out on all those fun life events because I felt like the restaurant couldn't survive without me. What was like the next big pivotal m- moment for you? Uh, in a- about two years after I bought the restaurant out entirely, I opened up a food truck. Okay. So I had a, a good friend of mine and-, and some regulars who joked around that, you know, when they got married, I have to cater their wedding with a food truck. That's right. For the, the first two years, or it was five years that you, there was the plan, right? To pay back in five years. But you, but you were able to do that in a shorter amount of time. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. And I was able to buy the food truck outright with cash as well. So as you're making more money, doubling your personal income, mm-hmm. instead of going out and buying a new car or getting a house or getting a new condo, you're doubling down on that note. And, you know, that, that was always something I felt I needed to do is I need to reinvest in the business, reinvest in my like staff. listen to Dave Ramsey or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. what, what, how, did, how would you say Dave Ramsey would have influenced you on in paying back that note? You know, uh, he is very much against debt, and that's how I grew up. Let's not have any debt whatsoever. Let's, debt was a bad word yeah. in my family and in my mind. And you, as I grew older, I realized you can actually leverage debt a little bit more, but I, you know, there's a certain level you have to be comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is his advice? If, 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 he, if you were Dave Ramsey giving advice to my listeners right now on, like, if you have debt, this is how you pay off. What is that strategy? Um, you know, it, it depends. I would say if, if I was Dave Ramsey, I would yeah. say don't take on any debt whatsoever. Where, uh, were you, where were you in my life when I was 17 years old? <laughs> yeah, in everyone's lives yeah. at that age. Um, you know, but, but now I realize there is, again, some value to debt, but I think you have to learn how to be responsible with debt. Yeah. So if you can't be responsible with debt and you feel like you're not going to be able to pay something off, then I would focus all your money, all your time on reducing that debt, even if it's a low interest rate, because you don't need that stress breaking you down. Right. You know, uh, It'll affect your mental health if you're not comfortable with so it. So you put all of your excess into getting out from underneath this debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, the year is now, what, two... 2014, 17? Yeah, with the food truck. When you get out of debt. So two years to do that. That's fucking awesome, dude. Thank so you. So like now you start, okay, you have this excess income. Because now how much were you paying a month to get out of debt? Uh, I think we we're at 1200 a month. Was the minimum. Yeah. But you were probably paying more than that. Yeah. What, yeah. 24? And then we- In two and a half years? I, I couldn't remember the, S- sounds like. the final amount. Yeah. yeah. So where you have this new cash flow that's not going to Dave anymore. It's going to you. Where does it actually go? Uh, it goes back into the business. Okay. Uh, that's, and how? Uh, you know, I bought that first food truck. Then it was, hey, let's buy another food truck. Okay. Let's uh, increase uh, living wages for my staff. Let's p- pay a higher living wage. Let's make sure they're taken care of. So maybe I can enjoy uh, a Friday off. Maybe yeah. less you'll, time maybe training let's not new get people crazy. and then yeah. just having somebody to stick around, right? Mm-hmm. Um, why food trucks? You know, I I've always loved the idea of a food truck. T- to me, it's you know pure cooking. You're there. 
you're bringing the party to someone else. I didn't have a liquor license at the time. So, uh, you know, drunk people, a hot dog and a beer go hand in hand, you know, and who doesn't want to come back for seconds or thirds of a hot dog with mac and cheese and bacon on there after you've had a few beers. Yeah. What was the biggest impact you would say the food truck had in your business in hindsight? You know, it taught me that I didn't have to be at the restaurant all the time because I, I had to run the food truck. Right. Um, so it taught me to kind of let go just a little bit. Yeah. What were your systems and processes like to be able to walk away from the, the brick and mortar? Uh, I, the amount of checklists I wrote, uh, you know, step one, turn the key, unlock the door. Step yeah. two, walk in, disarm yeah. the alarm. It seems so silly, right? Yeah. Uh, but those are super important. I remember, you know, calling my mom at one point and complaining. I'm like, man, these, thank you so much these for teaching kids. me. Yeah. I'm, these meanwhile, kids. I'm I mean, I'm a kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, they don't even know how to sweep. I have to teach these guys how to sweep. This is, thank you so much for, you know, little things like that. And so I wrote a, a process on how to sweep, how to mop. But um, the, the, your job as an owner is to paint the picture of mm-hmm. perfection, to leave no stones unturned so that when they say, I don't know how to do that, you're like, no, you do. I trained here's, you. Here it is. It's here's, in this manual. Here's it, it's written down. Yeah. And, and then digging into it even deeper, you know, uh, at the time, maybe those those kids didn't have a mom or a dad there to teach them right. how to sweep. And how blessed was I to have that? Right. Um, did you ever have issues with people not doing checklists? All the time to this how, day. How, yeah. how do you how do you put pressure on them? You, um, you know, it's uh, what is it? Danny Myers, the constant gentle press pressure. Yeah. I always tell them about the. Uh, the little salt and pepper shaker, you know, keep it in the center of the table. Don't let it fall over the edge. Just keep pushing it yeah. closer and closer, you know, until you get it right in the spot. And then an hour later, it's going to be moved a little to the right. And if you catch it an hour later, it's going to be a lot better than when it's fallen off over the right. table. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I that book is a, a book uh, setting the table that I give to all my managers nice. uh, and, and anyone. I, I give a bonus if they read that book, if they read it and tell me how we can apply it to the restaurant um, in a seen uh, a ton of growth uh because of that so were you on the food truck every day were you out and about with the food truck every day or was that kind of just like a in a catering event here or like a you know a festival there or did you have some like balance of being in the store and out early on it was let's do one event with the food truck and then got to make sure the store is not burning down yeah and then it's like okay now let's try two events in a week yeah. And make sure the store is not burning down. Well, that's a cool application with the food truck because then you, you it lets it kind of like turn up the dial on getting out of the restaurant mm-hmm. where you don't have to be open seven days a week with the food truck. Yeah, you're using the restaurant as your commissary where you're probably doing all of your prep and mm-hmm. then you load up the food truck, you have a home base, you can leave and like as as your team gets stronger and stronger without you being there, you can take on more load with the food truck and then scale the food truck. What haven't we discussed? And as this place gets louder and louder just stay right up on that mic. okay um you know we, we just talked about the food truck uh you know expanding into the second brick and mortar uh you know it's probably two years after i opened up the initial food truck um yeah 2019 and that was uh, a big learning experience for me because a lot of people told me not to expand why not um specifically in this case not not to expand in general but the uh, landlord in this scenario uh, maybe wasn't the of the mindset of a high tide raises all ships very much let's not create a relationship let's get as much money as we can out of tenants and let's keep churning them through sort of thing okay so there you just basically had some people foreshadow the type of person you were working with was going on and uh, and I was like no I, I can make it work I mean it's it's hot dogs you know I, yeah. I really want to expand yeah and instead of listening to uh, others advice you know I've, I've always been hard-headed and I need to get my own licks in before I yeah. uh, believe someone else which is not the way you you should be I mean it's <laughs> kind of crazy how we get the blinders on yeah you know? when, when, when we're when we have this vision we have this dream we want it so bad it's all we've been thinking about for the past five six seven years mm-hmm. and it's right there it's right it's it's, it's in, within reach I'm I can scale and like you just kind of put these blinders on it you don't see the things that I, like people will tell you, like, "Hey, warning, warning!" Like, yeah, but and it, you just I, ignore I, I, them and keep going forward. Other people maybe, but not me. Yeah, right. Um, so, like, what's your advice to that person that might be in that same situation? You know, uh, listen. Yeah. Just listen and and don't be so focused on one thing that you want to force yourself to make it happen. Be willing to pivot. I mean, I'd gotten so many opportunities and and reached out to by so many different landlords. We want your concept in our restaurant. 
and uh, it never worked out for whatever reason. I kept saying no, or maybe the numbers didn't make sense that by the time I got to this deal, I was just like, no matter what, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen yep. instead of seeing those warning signs. Yeah, yeah. So um, when – I'm trying to think of where did the take – like when was the, the next big challenge for you? Was it 2019 when, when you had to get rid of this location? Like take us through the, the eventual crumble of this warning – that you know everybody was yeah. warning you not to do it but what, what ended up happening what was the peak you know it was uh you know covid wasn't good for a lot of reasons but it, it was good and it helped me get out of this situation this was a big bar situation we had to be open until two in the morning uh you know i didn't realize the people i needed to work with and hire that were willing to work into two in the morning are also going to be the same people that when i walk back into the prep kitchen uh you know they might be doing some illegal drugs off the the countertop yeah. Uh, and uh, I, the more I kind of dealt with that 2 a.m. crowd and then, you know, all the issues that arose from it, the more I realized that's not my lifestyle. I don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and once COVID hit, New Mexico uh, shut everything down, as, as most places did. And uh, we never got to reopen that location mm. due to that. Mm. So uh, I was able to break the lease that way. But I think without COVID, it would have been. Uh, a very long drawn out process that would have been expensive or even just taken all my motivation out of me. What was the big thing that was going on inside of you um, that, that made you want to kind of change your lifestyle too? I think this is a big pivotal point in you. Was, did you get a low? Was there a, 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 something that happened that you're like, you're like never again? You know, there wasn't necessarily a low. I mean, I mean, getting kicked out of school was, uh, you know, pretty pivotal in the sense that, uh, you know, a lot of my friends that had carried on down that, that path, I saw what that ended up with yeah. and, and where they ended up with. So there wasn't necessarily a low. This is one of the few instances that maybe I learned from other people's, you know, experiences a little bit and, and realized that I didn't want to go down that path anymore um, and that I need to focus on, on my own personal growth. Well, it's a weird time because it's also during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So like you can't mark that moment as like this is when things started to change my business because it would be another two years before things could really start to of course. change in your business in a normal world, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you still had the food trucks, right, during this time? So you still, I did. So you have one location. You're still two food trucks. Two food trucks. Um, how did you – I mean, I don't like diving so much deep into the pandemic because we all kind of know how that story of went. Course. But, like, how did that influence your business today? Where are you today because of that? You know, uh, to go was massive. I didn't do any third-party delivery because I, I didn't trust the drivers. I didn't do a lot of online ordering because that was an expensive process that I didn't want to set up at the time. Yeah. And it's, you know, uh, the food's better when you eat it in store. I could control the quality. Right. It's very protective about that. And the pandemic forced everyone's hand a little bit, I think, to pivot and yeah. focus on to go. And, uh, you know, it was a scary month. And then sales started to skyrocket. Um, we saw a ton of growth with the food trucks. We were able to go out and do uh, no or low contact deliveries, uh, post up at places of where maybe other restaurants had shut down entirely and kind of feed, uh, you know, there was a need for yeah. food. Also, you know, I had that restaurant that had just shut down, an extra food truck. I didn't want to waste that food. I was taught not to waste food. So we started a program early on called uh, Project 86 that anyone who uh, had been laid off, didn't have money, didn't have food, uh, come eat for free. And, uh, we fed probably, uh, you know, a couple hundred people, uh, every time we went out for, for free, just let's not waste this food. Let's encourage others to okay. kind of come out and, and, uh, you know, social distance as best they could, but also it created a little bit of a community as well. So help me understand this. Is this something that you you continue today, Project 86? That was just during COVID. Okay. Yeah. So, like, I was like, well, you're going to, like, a big event. So if you don't sell out at the event, mm -hmm. like, then you go to some type of, like, shelter and just... No, yeah. Th that was just towards COVID oh, um, yeah. and, and to help, you know, a ton of people donated, too. So we got to do it a few more times. But it was just to ensure that, that no one went hungry. And, uh, you know, gave me the ability to, to pay my staff to actually work okay. instead of, you know, just sitting at home. So let's 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 jump fast forward to, say, like uh, the summer of 2022. Right. This is I feel like when the world's kind of back to mm -hmm. normal. Where was your business at this point? Um, you, we were doing more sales than we'd ever done. Uh, I was working in the restaurant less than I'd ever worked in the restaurant. Yep. I was working more on the restaurant uh fine-tuning all these processes, these procedures, food costing, you know, I was more on top of the numbers than I'd ever been. Where was your, so where was your gross, like say back in 2000, was it 
14 when you took over? And you said in a couple, like in a year, you were like double or two years. You I think we're at, yeah, I think we're at like 250,000 yearly sales. And then we jumped to 500,000 then 600,000. Wow. And uh, where were you back in like the beginning of the pandemic or the end of the pandemic? Sorry. No, I think at the end of the pandemic, we're at 700, <coughs> 700,000. That's awesome, yeah. man. And um, I mean, what, what are your operational expenses like at this point? Uh, I mean, really minimal, just rent and operating two food trucks out of one location is yeah. Uh, and treating that one location as your commissary, there's a lot of efficiencies okay. involved in that. So, what were the biggest changes since 2022? Actually, that's that's the the cue. That's the that's we're going to cue it there. We're going to take one more quick break to thank our sponsors. When we come back, you're going to talk about where you are today in the past like two years and how you've evolved. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now, Restaurant Systems Pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems increase your profit and find better work life balance all you have to do is click the link below uh so the year is 2022 when we leave off the the pandemic's over you're doing 700,000 a year you have one brick and mortar location and two food trucks um where was what percent profit were you running at this point if you don't mind me asking uh percent profit we were running i think 45 50 percent prime cost Okay. Um, so uh, we're fifteen percent, ten to fifteen percent profit in twenty twenty two. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's great. Most a lot of people wish they could be there. Mm. Um, so to paint the picture of what your business is like. Take me through the systems. Like, what, like what is like, like what does your business look like? What are the tools you're using? What POS are you using? Kind of get into like the nitty gritty of your systems at this time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I've mentioned this. I'm an information gatherer, so I'll spin there hours reading about different point of sales, different yeah. tech stacks. Um, and, and a lot of it is due to your podcast. Uh, you, you'll mention a company and I know you won't mention something without, uh, you know, doing your due diligence first. So it yeah. makes my life easier. So uh, I got involved with Mies probably uh, maybe in 2019 and okay. started putting all my recipes in there and the scalability, the ability to have pictures and videos uh, was massive for training and, and consistency. So I, I have that. I have Toast, which integrates with just about everything for online ordering. For Were you using my links for Toast and Mies? Because uh, I feel like that's one of the reasons why you really stand I on my memory. Because I, I got you a lot of money, hopefully. Yeah, You're man. Good. Thank Good. you so much. No, uh, yeah, I always try to use your affiliate links Thank for you, everything. I think so even much. restaurantowner.com, when I re-signed up, I used a different email and oh, man, used your link. I appreciate link. that. You have um, no idea how much that helps. Um, sorry, keep going. Yeah, um, a Toast point of sale. I, I use that pop menu as well um, for, for my website um, third party deliver I think I used Chowley for a little while until Toast started their integrations yep. uh, you know the biggest game changer of course and, and why I'm here today is Restaurant Systems Pro with mm -hmm. um, you know Fred and the team uh, to me that that's been the biggest addition in addition to Toast that's made me and, and freed me up to, to not work in the restaurant as much but again on growing the business itself I'm not like we didn't have a conversation before this to have you say all these things, right? I just want to <laughs> no. make sure everyone's clear. Yeah, He's not is, being paid. It's all organic. Yeah, this is all. I, I had no idea that you're. I mean, now that you mention it, like my memory is being jogged. I'm like, this is. This sounds so familiar because I remember seeing those leads come in mm -hmm. and I get notified. And um, so, um, what was the big impact? So you mentioned Mies, you mentioned Pot Menu, you mentioned uh, Restaurant Systems Pro. Um, how did Mies really move the needle for you and make your your organization better? Well. You know, I, I think like most restaurateurs, uh, most of my recipes were pen and paper. And if that paper got messed up, you'd have to reprint a new one. If you had a big catering coming up and you're scaling for serving 500 people instead of 100 people, uh, someone might carry the one in the wrong area. And now your entire recipe for your mac and cheese is tasting terrible. Yeah. And, and Mies does a lot of that auto scaling and, and allows you to have even videos of here's how you do the proper emulsion on a vinaigrette. Right. So here's what the end product should look like. So if it doesn't look like this, you know it's wrong. Don't yeah. serve it to the guest. It's not just a place to put your recipes. It's mm -hmm. a place to put your recipes uh, and scale your recipes and to train on how to execute the recipes and to centralize all that information, especially when you're scaling, if you have three or four locations, it's all centralized. So yeah. if you make a change in the system, it gets pushed to all the, mm -hmm. the, the different outlets that are using those recipes. It's very powerful. Um, how did this really start to help you with your profit profitability though? I'm curious about that. So it, it helped me focus more, you know, if, if you're doing the same menu for a long time, maybe you don't cost out your menu every quarter like you should. 
And this really forced me to, you know, really, are we doing this five ounce portion on fries? And then watching my staff do it and weigh out to make sure we're doing five ounces. Maybe we're doing seven ounce portions yeah. instead. And that extra two ounces multiplied by 200 times a day right. over the course of 300. It's a lot of free fries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so it helped cut, cut cost in that way and, and helped me also rethink uh, my menus a little bit. What, what are we doing now that we didn't do six years ago? What product am I getting in? Is the blue cheese as good of a quality now as it was then? Do I need to relook at the, the, who I'm getting this from, where I'm getting it from. Was that just because you had a, you were forced to go through all of your ingredients mm-hmm. to, to build out these different yeah. recipes? And, and, and you can pay me to uh, do all this for you, but I, again, felt like it was important for me to go through the process, make sure it's correct, and, and rethink, help me just rethink the entire menu. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how did your employees, how do, how do they, are they receptive to me? Like, do they embrace it? Like, what's that look like? It, it takes a, a little bit of goading to get them to look at the recipe, uh, especially if they're a trained cook somewhere else. They're like, oh, I know how to make a coleslaw. Well, yes, but do you know how to make urban hot dog coleslaw? Right. Uh, do you know how to make it consistently? Can There's you no read question. a recipe? This is how we do it. Exactly. There's a video tutorial. There, there are measurements. And like, that's always one of my interview questions is, do you know how to follow a recipe? And they always say yes. I always start them off with a coleslaw recipe. And uh, in the recipe, it says keep everything separate, you know, the wet from the dry mix, and then wrap them. And that's a little test. You know, do they mix it right away? If they mix it right away, they didn't read the recipe. Uh, To me, that's always a sign of uh, this might be a problem later on. Right. Yeah, if they're not doing it right on the first day when I'm watching them, what's it going to be like when I'm not there? Right, for sure. Um, Anything else about me before we move on to pop menu? Um, No, I just, I think it's the scalability of it makes it big. Uh, If you only have... Uh, 0.25 cups of ancho powder in the entire restaurant. You can type that in, right. and it'll scale the entire recipe around that. Yeah, that's huge. Like, so now you know what your 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 weakest point is. Mm-hmm. This is a we only have like we, we're running out of this item. How how many orders can we make before we run out? Exactly. Right? And, and I don't do fractions, so if yeah. I need to scale something to 0.33, it's not going to be a good time with yeah. anyone. And especially yeah. if you're doing catering and you get this huge oh like this is going to be a 500 person event and we mm-hmm. need to bring. 2,000 hot dogs like and the ingredients for the different types of hot dogs we like do we have enough product on hand to do that like I don't know put it in a mise exactly. and then like instantly you know like we need to go to the store uh, it's it's powerful tool so um, pot menu what was it about pot menu that pulled you in when you, when you heard about it you know pot menu to me the ability for the reviews whenever I say that I feel like I'm saying pot menu <laughs> and like yeah like it's a menu of all this high school all over but again no matter how hard yeah. I try to emphasize the P the pop menu it always comes out like, and I just noticed <laughs> it with you too. Like, yeah. I don't feel as bad. Keep going. Um, uh, to me, the big thing was the the reviews. Um, being able to have those reviews centralized, the email marketing. Um, that's not my strong suit is, you know, signing up for MailChimp and all these other things. It was kind of all integrated in yeah. Pop Menu. So what did you get with Pop Menu? <laughs> so with Pop Menu, uh, we, uh, you know, people sign up for your, we call it the pack. Yep. Um, so they get to join your email list and you can select something that's already on your menu because they auto populate their menu and send someone out to take some beautiful pictures. If you're doing a special on a certain dog, you just click a button. It'll type something up for you. I think they even have AI generated, uh, wording now. Well, they'll, they'll like essentially write the email for you oh, and you wow. can add edit, which is pretty amazing. Um, they have a feature I was looking into where they automatically answer phone calls and it's an AI telling your guest, uh, you know, press one for catering, press, you know, all these sort of different options. I haven't utilized it yet, but it's just one of those companies that's always trying to grow yep. and add to their offering, which I think is important. You don't want to be stuck with a software that's staying stagnant, especially in today's day and age. So the, I, I know that you mentioned the reviews. I know they have the reviews um, and that is internal. That's not like, like that. talk to us a little bit more about how the, that review system works. Yeah, so so that is, I know that is unique to pop many, like no other that I'm aware of, I don't. I don't think that any other service in that tier offers that feature. That's unique to Pop Menu. And and so th- this that's why it's called Pop Menu is the reviews pop. Okay. You click on it, and I think it makes a popping noise, or maybe it used to. Okay. Um, but you can have your guests. They go to your website, and it prompts them to click on something, and they can immediately write a review. And that review goes directly to you, your management team, whoever it may be, instead of automatically going on Google. So what you can do is you can hide that review if it's a bad review, um, but it still gives you the opportunity to reply to that guest. 
and say someone writes a bad review about the crafty dog and says, you know, the mac and cheese tasted terrible. It'll go directly to me and my team. We'll see that. We don't want that on our website. We don't want people going to the website and seeing how terrible something was. Um, and it gives us the immediate opportunity to then reply and try and fix that. Tell us when you came in, what can we do to make it better? Um, you know, little things like that. So the order of operation is if somebody goes to your website, mm-hmm. they are prompted to give a review. But like if you're in the restaurant like and you had a bad experience, is your first reaction going to be to, to go to your the, the restaurant website? Or do you think it would be to go to a review site? Normally, like, it'd be well, go to a review site. But if you Google Urban Hot Dog Company, Pop Menu, the, and their SEO okay. kind of pops up first. I mean, if you're used to using right. Google or Yelp, I think you're going to go to those regardless. Got if it. you're not, you know, if you're not the type of person that wants to fix it on the spot and talk to management, and, and not everyone is. I think it was Hum Systems was a, a, a tool that was out. Like it was a customer review tool that was out maybe like ten or like eight years ago, or maybe like seven years ago, where like. Um, it was like a tablet that was on the table. So while the, the the customer was right in the restaurant, there was a way to like go through a tablet or I think it was actually the check. They would give you the check and they would open it and it would be like, you know, your check here. And on the other side would be like a tablet that would be like, that would, that would uh, prompt you prompt some questions you to like answer some questions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like that, is it? Cause you no. got, okay. No, this is, yeah. People specifically would go to the website and write the review. I think it also aggregates, you sign up your Google and your Yelp onto the web page, and it'll also tell you when you get reviews on those websites as well. Got it. And the, those re- reviews that are left on your site, did you just say that they push the other site? Like, t- take us to the aggregation one more time. So they pull from other websites. Okay. So they pull from Google. They pull from Yelp um, if you have it set up with them specifically. And they'll let you know when you get a new Google review, when you get a new Yelp review. But for the website on Pop Menu itself, when they write the review, you have the ability to immediately respond to that and allow it on your website. So they can review specific dishes. So you can get reviews from different platforms, i.e. Yelp or whatever, TripAdvisor. Mm-hmm. You will get a notification on your platform saying, hey, you have a new review, positive or negative. Uh, you can choose to pull that review and display it on Pop Menu, and or you can choose to... Um, you know, address that review on the uh, satellite adjacent platform. If somebody like say on TripAdvisor or Yelp leaves you a bad review, like you're getting notified saying, Hey, go come check this out. Yeah. I don't think you can add their reviews to your website okay. specifically. They have to review on pop menu for you to add it to your website. If that makes sense. But it's an aggregator of reviews across all platforms. Yeah. On the back end, it'll Got let it. you know. Yeah. Got it. And then, the, then you're also getting reviews on your own website that are unique. And this is the internal. This is what you see when you go to the website mm-hmm. and you can see those reviews. But can you also pull the reviews from the other platforms and, and, and like spotlight them? That I'm not as sure about. I'm okay. sure there might be a widget where you could. But pop menu is more specific to the dishes. Okay. So you could select on someone has a fettuccine dish on their website, you could select that and say, hey, this is my favorite dish. Here's why I like it. Yeah. So it's a little bit more, you get personalized feedback on that specific dish. Yeah. Um, so you, when did you adopt the pop-up menu? Um, man, that might have been right before COVID. So 2019, I think. 2019. Um, how, how did that influence your, your revenue, having that online portal uh, the path of least resistance to online ordering. Like, how did that help you? Uh, I mean, it was. I, you were uh, an early adopter, probably yeah. you back then. Was See, I? Was the, were they a sponsor of mine? Did I? Did you discover them through my podcast? I think I gave you a review actually on Pop Menu, and we were looking for uh, people who had used it and whether or not they vouched for it. I think okay. Pop Menu was one where I said, "Yeah, I use it, and I like it, and here's what I like okay, about it." Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I know that they started sponsoring around 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're a company I still think is great. It's weird, man. The politics, it's probably weird that I'm even talking about this right now. I hope my sponsors don't get pissed off. <laughs> uh, but like, there's a lot of great companies out there. Like right now, uh, between, I've had Bento Box as, Box mm-hmm. as a sponsor going back, you know, 10, yep. 50, like, like, you know, eight years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Pop Menu has been great and uh, currently working with owner.com. And the more I work with these different companies, um, you know, like there's just, in my mind, uh, those are the things that you, as we go into the future, you will never be as good of a web designer as a oh, pop no. menu or an owner.com. 
you know and, and they make like, it so easy nowadays. Like, and that, that for me was huge. I don't have, I like learning things and I yeah. like going down these rabbit holes. I didn't have time to learn how to code. I didn't right. have time, you know, my, my space days are behind me, you, you know? And like the world is changing so fast, especially the digital world. Every mm-hmm. year things are different. They're better. And these platforms evolve with the times. Well, and your West website used to not be as important. Right. But now that's the first place people go They're, they If they don't like your website, if it's not mobile friendly, they may never show up to your restaurant right. because of that. Right. For sure. Um, so like these are, there's things like I think to, to exist as a, a restaurant in the future, you really need to know when to get the fuck out of the way mm-hmm. and to have those strategic partners that will do the job better than you could ever do on your own. Um, so, I mean, definitely accountant high on that list. Definitely anything to do with marketing or digital presence high on that list. Um, what about social media? Where do you fall on social media? Do you, do you prioritize your digital presence in terms of like SEO and website optimization over social media? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, uh, your way to interact with your guests on the most personal level nowadays is social media, whether it's posting a special or just sometimes letting them know life events. We're opening up a new restaurant. We're doing this and we're doing that. So social media, I think, is uh, fortunate in some cases and unfortunate in others is probably the the biggest window into who you are as a restaurant, who you are as an owner as well. Yeah. Um, It's weird. I think there's a balance. Um, It's like one of those things is, yes, you need to be on these platforms to create awareness, but at the same time, like what is the, what are the side effects Mm -hmm. of that? And are those side effects or like, can we just collectively some like say like we need to, yes, we need to use these tools digitally to, to have digital presence, but can we get some other options for tools that don't exploit my, my data and me? And yeah, everything pro- you know, about you. Yeah, yeah, and like society and it, like, do they need to be so divisive? Oh, uh, it's, <laughs> you know? it's terrifying the amount yeah. of information they collect. I think right. the first time I did my own targeted ad, I was like, you can, they know this? Like they, <laughs> yeah. I can target expecting women? Like that doesn't seem right to me. Right, it's weird, man. Uh, I don't want to go down that rabbit yeah. hole. Uh, we could if we wanted to. Maybe I'll save it for an, an expert because I do want to have that conversation. Because we're living in a time right now where like, I think most consumers in the sense we're just victims because we just didn't know how that work that world works especially when you're seeing with ai right now too Mm -hmm. where it's just like if we don't educate people early on about this and like especially as we're coming into a new election year like there's so many major countries going into new election years and this stuff is like exponentially improving like moore's law to like moore's law is kicking in right now where this idea of like every year it gets twice as good um and ai is the first thing that we've created that is able to work on itself to make itself better. Yeah, and, and it just keeps sucking in data. Every second of every day, it's 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 redefining itself and working on itself. It's scary. And I think we really need to like get ahead of it because it can be a great tool for society. Yeah. I don't know why I'm going down this road, man. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that, I listened to too many Joe Rogan episodes. Yeah, the, the Terminator is <laughs> coming to life. Uh, so so back to your story. Um, what was the, like the latest evolution for you and what you're going through that in terms of the, the biggest impact a change has had on your organization. Yeah. Um, as far as tech goes or Anything. just in general, I'm not going to steer you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the biggest impact for me and, uh, you know, honestly it has to be restaurant systems pro. When did you start working with restaurants? Uh, pro? that was April, okay. I think of, uh, 2023, almost a year, almost, yeah, Two almost a away. full year Ten months. And I was, uh, aggressively looking at restaurant systems pro and restaurant 365. So what between the two, what was it that made you go with restaurant, restaurants, systems pro? You know, it, it was the personal touch. Yeah. Uh, Fred was doing these 60 days where he'd dive in and how often do you get to talk to the CEO, the president of a company, um, who also has restaurant experience, right. chef experience, opened up restaurants, right. uh, is completely immersed in the restaurant world, not just the tech world. And he gives you p- your perspective and he didn't sugarcoat it. If you didn't c- show up to those 60 days and you didn't put in the work, uh, you know, there's a few times he went on some rants with some people who, and, and told them some tough truths. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I want to, you know, regardless of whatever platform you choose to go with, it's not paying a monthly subscription and having your problems be solved. Mm-hmm. It's access to the tools to do the work, but you still have to do the work and it's going to help you. It's a checklist for you. Yep. 
and that's you, you know that's the best way to yeah. describe it and that's that's what you miss as an independent restaurant owner is there is you, obviously your boss are the customers the guests they're your end of the day boss but no one's telling you hey you haven't got your recipe costing cards in yet no one's telling you you haven't uh, done your labor allotment for this week but you know who is it's it's Fred and is his team with his weekly meetings yeah. you know I'll get an email from Brittany um, and that's where the personal touch of restaurant systems pro comes into play is she's like hey Matt you haven't done this yet and I'm like oh, man, I, I don't want to <laughs> disappoint great Brittany Brittany yeah. impression right yeah. there <laughs> you know I, I don't want to disappoint her Fred or the team uh, yeah. you know because they, they the see this potential that, and the other, are, yeah yeah because there's community associated mm-hmm. with this where they get together um, so in terms of actually implementing these tools what was the biggest challenge for you man getting all those recipes into the system is time sticking you got to put the work in uh you know i took out the the book of yields you know and you you know a tablespoon of uh kosher salt is going to weigh different than a tablespoon of ancho chili powder yeah and i really dug deep into there because i wanted my system to be as accurate as possible and you already had me's going in the background too do these two things kind of propel each other do they complement each other uh they Restaurant Systems Pro offers something similar to Mies, not as, um, you know, it doesn't do the conversions or anything, but I, I did have to retype out all my recipes, which was a little killer because I'd just redone it again. I tried to do it every few years in Mies, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, oh, no, I don't want to do this again. Um, but I did it with something else in mind because in Restaurant Systems Pro, it's completely tied to each invoice that comes in. Right. So Maybe every, I should introduce the CEO of Mies, the CEO yeah. of Restaurant if Systems Pro. If they could partner Pro, up. I, get a little integration please. action going there. Yeah. Wow, man. I never knew I'd be able to pull the strings like this. You are. Ten you're, years you're later. You're the puppet master. <laughs> I know these people. Um, all right. That's good to know. Um, so it was a little bit redundant, mm-hmm. but um, I mean. But it was, it was a good practice to do yeah, it yeah. because when I just put them in me's, it was just, these are my recipes yeah. and this is what I want staff to follow. When I put in Restaurant Systems Pro, it was, again, going through that book of yields. And I honestly, I, I had to edit some of my recipes again just yeah. to make it work in there. And you have to create sub but it recipes. it forces you to pay attention to these details and find these like little things. It does. Tweak and tweak and mm-hmm. tweak. Uh, so what were some of the other struggles with Restaurant Systems Pro? Um, you know, you just like any other uh, aspect of your life, you get in what you put into it. Yeah. You get out of it what you put into it. And it to be successful in this industry, you have to constantly be working and constantly be rethinking things. So if you're someone who's not going to put in the work, not put in the time, and uh, not give it at all, I don't think your restaurant's going to be successful. But I also don't think you're going to get what you need to out of restaurant systems pro to be successful right. to begin with. So it, it is a lot of work. And the other step is now that you've got everything in there and you've bought into it, how do you get your staff to right. buy into it? That's and, huge. Mm-hmm. So how have you been getting your staff to buy into it? Yeah. I, I actually gave my staff a little bit of an option. I had my manager set up meetings with restaurants 365. She was there with me at my West side location. Uh, Cause the new location wasn't open yet. And I wanted to give her some autonomy to choose something. Yeah. Um, and I, I gave her the pros and the cons of, of each and gave her the decision. Thankfully, she, I pushed her a little bit more in the restaurant systems pro direction. Um, but I, I wanted to give, uh, you know, get honest feedback on both. And so that helped get my manager tied into it. And um, Brittany and the team, they want your managers on those meetings with them. Yeah. And because you know, I get yelled at. Why isn't Cheyenne on this meeting? Why isn't Mike in on this meeting? And uh, if they're not on the meeting, then it's just me doing everything all the time. Right. So they almost force you to step even farther back from your business and empower those as well. Yeah. Um, so what was like when, when you like you, you, you clearly had this path, you're either going to go restaurant systems pro or restaurant 365. Um, you mentioned the, the, the hands-on ability, but what else was the, the differentiator for, I have ideas, but I'm trying not to, I want to hear it from you. I don't want to, I don't want to like lead you into what I'm thinking, but like, what was it really aside from the more hands-on approach access to Fred that was more appealing about restaurant systems pro, you know, they felt like a restaurant team. Okay. Uh, you know, they have their elite groups, the, 
the you can reach out to other restaurateurs uh, and ask them some questions in these 60 days. They're going through a lot of the same struggles you are, yeah. not in just getting the system set up, but I mean, there's been meetings where I've gone to on just in the 60 day, not even in the elite group where people are breaking down about their problems. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Fred's coaching. Here's what's going on. You need yeah. to cut this out. You need and to they have, focus has, on yourself. He's not just coaching you from like a third party perspective. Like, tell me your story. Here's what I think. Here's what I've done. Here's, Here's what, what I've I seen. No, because yeah. I have access to your books. I have mm-hmm. access to your data. I'm yeah. looking at what's going on here so they can drill and coach on real numbers. Well, it's the, the level of accountability. Yeah. And I, you don't have that as an independent restaurateur. You don't have corporate coming down on your neck and saying, you know, clean those wheels or your prime costs are too high that's what Fred and his team do. And I, you know, restaurant 365 may offer that to some degree. They have restaurant 365 university where they do teaching. I'm curious, but what about the actual like user interface when you were looking at how to use the system, what was more appealing about restaurant assistance? You know, and that's right now, I think the edge to that and you know, Fred don't kill me, but I think restaurant 365 has a ton more money put into it at this point and they've been around longer. So yeah. they're, they're a little bit more user friendly on the base level. Which, I mean, to me, that's updating a UI and yeah. Restaurant Systems Pro is there. Right. Um, you know, that was one of the things that my staff brought up is, oh, look at this cool little shiny app they have. And, and Restaurant Systems Pro has a great app and it does everything you need it to do. But it's not, um, you know, as, as shiny and, and refined as 365 right now. Right. Um, so, like, some of my, my thoughts and things I've heard um, is that when... With re- like restaurant 365 can be almost overwhelming and you almost need a degree to mm-hmm. get in there and figure out all the features. Whereas restaurant systems pro is a little more like it, here's how to do it. We've proven that we know because the, the story of restaurant systems pro is they started as kind of like a restaurant uh, owner.com where like they have all these systems and processes and checklists and spreadsheets and you join our community. And we give you this, basically we hand you an operations mm-hmm. manual and then you implement these systems into your business, and that evolved that like that paper operations manual evolved into a uh, floppy disk, so you could upload it on your computer, mm-hmm. which evolved into a website, which evolved into a service as a software, and uh, it's been continually to evolve. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that um, they're they're a constantly growing, fast growing company, mm-hmm. and it feels I feel like it's more. If you're not a systems-minded person, I feel like it's more rigid and it, it forces you through the, the motions, and it's a little bit more intuitive. Is but it, it, I don't want to put is that right or wrong? No, it, it certainly is. And once you look at the system, and that's the big thing is the hands-on. They you don't have to have a degree to get into Restaurant Systems Pro. They'll teach you right how it goes, and they have all these little help. You know, you type someone, "Hey, how do I do this?" and you'll get a response in a few minutes. Here's how exactly how you do this. Yeah. And also here's a video on how to do it on your system and here's what it looks like. Yeah. See, I so the reason why I say this, so um I've talked a little about about this, but we're going to be launching um, three tiers of like basically membership at Restaurant Stoppable starting in February around the time this episode goes live. Is the first tier we're having a new website. It's going to be searchable content. That's been a huge request from our listeners to have content where I can go by city, by type of restaurant, by type of owner, mm-hmm. by like all these different like filters. Like I want to listen to marketing content. I want to listen to technology content. We're going to have that. And then we're going to have community where it's basically live events reflecting what's happening on the show. I'm going to invite you to do a Q&A at Restaurant Unstoppable Network where you'll be able to talk to my listeners. Um, so teaser uh, that's coming down the barrel uh and then there's the the next tier which is if i eric cacciatore after 1057 episodes as of today's episode i'm opening a restaurant here are the, the, the strategic partners i'm going with based off of what i've learned and i'm going with restaurant systems pro because i know me eric cacciatore hate systems, not <laughs> systems oriented type of individual. I need that hand holding. I need that community. I need that support to execute this. I'm not doing it on my own. And I feel like with restaurant system, uh, restaurant 365, you kind of have to have somebody on your team who is that rocket fuel integrator type. Uh, and you need to be kind of good at inter- like just implementing these things. Yeah. That's not me. So that's, that's why I'm going with restaurant assistance pro what's going through your mind as I say that. Well, you know, and it, it went back, you know, my mantra, is a high tide raises all ships and uh, restaurant systems pro i think helps raise everyone you know they they bring you to the next level they you know 
yes, you may not be the systems oriented person, but you shouldn't have to be. That's right. part of what being part of a community is. And as a restaurant community, let's help each other grow right. and be better. And you've been doing that with your podcast and, and the networks that you've created. And, you know, I think Restaurant Systems Pro is that exactly on a numbers level and a, a focus on these every little aspect of your business to help you be successful. And if you're not doing it right, they're going to hold you accountable right. and be honest about it, which where, where can you get that? No, uh, no restaurant way, 365 man. probably just wants you to pay your monthly, you, you know, bill. They, you know, at, at the end of the day, they, they want to see you succeed here. Um, instead of just seeing you as a paycheck, they see you as a, another person that can help the community. So you're investing in all this tech, right? Mm -hmm. what, are you ramping up for something? Is there something on the horizon that you're yeah. trying to get prepared for? What's the future look like? So my, my goal uh, is to have a restaurant group, uh, you know, expand, grow the Urban Hot Dog brand, the Fat Frank's concept, do other restaurants, uh, you know, kind of take over uh, New Mexico and maybe some surrounding areas and, you know, kind of see where the growth goes from there. It's going to be new New Mexico yes. under the urban hot yeah. dog <laughs> flag. The flag. <laughs> um, so, so how does like Restaurant Systems Pro, like it seems like you're investing in technology right now to be able to cement what you are and how you do things. Is that a part of the strategy to scale? Definitely. Okay. And, and Restaurant Systems Pro uh, will offer a, a white glove service too, where it even has the accounting system. So I could say, if I'm franchising to someone in Arizona, here's uh, here's the point of sale we use. Here is the accounting we use. Here is the app that all your staff communicate on. I don't have the time or the money to build out that app. Right. Uh, Restaurant Systems Pro has that app for me. I I can, you know, brand that white glove that. It's now the Urban Hot Dog app that has all the same functions. Yeah, um, and it makes me seem more refined to possible future franchisees and investors and and um you know helps me with that goal to continue the growth if i ever go that route yeah yeah for sure um so i think you said in 2019 i was asking about profitability maybe it was 2022 i can't remember you said you were like fif between 15 and 10 percent you're mm -hmm. back and forth um where are you today uh you know i'm actually waiting on my books back for end of year right now but i I think we hit probably 40% prime cost this year. Okay. Um, so you shaved 5% off your cost of goods? Yeah. Or was that labor? Uh, it was cost of goods, labor. Um, you know, I through this, I was able to negotiate a better credit card rate. Um, you know, with Toast, I was able to uh, negotiate a prime vendor agreement, which I didn't know how to do before I joined Restaurant Systems Pro. Um, and so it helped me cut costs all across the board. Nice. And, and really dial in on that labor. I mean, you're you're not doing schedules three weeks out because what good does that do? You don't know what sales are going to be in three weeks. You know what sales were last week, and here's where you're over and under. So if you do a weekly schedule instead, you can really trim on yeah. a on a small scale, which over the course of a year adds up. So if you were doing between ten and fifteen percent profit, I'd, a couple I'd years, like, yeah, you're around, closer to twenty. Thinking around. twenty, yeah. that's awesome, dude. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, and it it blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, and every time I've sat down with a, a restaurant coach at Systems Pro, I'm like, Are you sure these numbers are right? Like, did and they're like, You know, yeah, that's that's right. All yeah. your stuff's in the system. And, and I was like, But but it doesn't make sense to me. And they're like, well, the numbers don't lie. And you get a hot concept, you know, you got a concept that has legs that can scale that, um, you can go to outside investors. Um, you, you're looking at brands like, uh, dat dog mm -hmm. and sup dog and, uh, dog house, you know, like these are proven concepts that, um, are scaling. They're not in your neck of the woods yet. You know, you can own your region. And this is, this is what I want to do, man. This is my, my, this is my dream is to help people take concepts into, to, have more kind of big companies, less giant companies that scale across mm -hmm. the country. I think uh, if we can regionize cuisine and we can help people grow locally and go deeper into their, their communities, um, I love that. Um, so what's what's the future look like for you? Um, you know, I, my future, immediate future, is I just opened up, you know, that new concept, a new restaurant six months ago. Yeah, how's that been going? Uh, you know, it's been, I completely changed the service model from quick service to uh, full service what would you servers. What uh, your, your hot dog concept, uh, urban, hot, urban Hot Dog? Is that quick service? So the original location is quick service. Okay. Yeah, so order at the counter, get your food. Um, this new location is more full service where I have a serving staff, uh, 20 you know, beers on draft, a full liquor license. Do you want to be more full service? You know, I've, or? I've always liked the juxtaposition of a hot dog with a nice cocktail. Yeah. Um, and I, I think 
the idea behind, you know, it was a little intentional of let's see, I know it works in a food truck. I know the concept works in quick service. Let's see what it does in full service, kind of like a beer garden, which I know Doghouse does some, something similar where you do have kind of a full yeah. service aspect. So if I can prove it works in all these facets, how much more easy is it going to be for me to grow it? If someone, hey, I don't, I don't want to open up a full service restaurant. I don't need a liquor license. Well, there's that let me open quick service or yeah. let me just do a food truck. There's that sweet spot between full service and quick service that is counter. Uh, but with a little elevated service where somebody mm. on the ground who's running food where maybe you have like a, a tabletop, like the number or you're mm-hmm. using maybe a long range systems like go you, find the table. Yeah, exactly. Or you're ordering from a QR code on a table that tells the, the kitchen where you're sitting. You know, there's there's ways to find that sweet spot where you can do more with less mm-hmm. and you don't need to have outrageous labor costs with, you know, five servers on staff where you're let, letting the customer do most of the work, you know. Is that like, are you trying to find that or are you yeah, do well, want to go more towards full service? I'm, I'm just trying to prove that it can work in multiple formats. Yeah. Um, and from that, you know, I think the next step is look at getting a warehouse and doing a, a commissary kitchen and really focusing on growth in that aspect, have all yeah. the food prepped in one area. And then of course there's other challenges of logistics. Uh, how do you get the food to each spot? Right. But to really prove that it's a concept that, that can grow. And, and as an owner operator, you can have, great profit margins you know it can be successful uh in in any format yeah yeah um what is the dream what's the vision uh start a restaurant group a hospitality group have a few different concepts underneath um you know really what i want to focus on and and what i've been able to do is help others grow the same way dave helped me grow yeah Uh, you know i've helped employees open up their own uh businesses i've given them tips i i encourage anyone who's interested in doing a food truck to uh, reach out to me, whether it's email or in person or a restaurant, and, uh, kind of give them the information that I didn't have. You know, I, I tried to reach out to other restaurants in the area. How do I get a beer and wine license? How do I open up a food truck? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the information I received wasn't uh, the truth in some cases, or I just got ignored in others. Wow. And it was a, a barrier to entry that, you know, I think I, I want my legacy to be in 10 years is the same as, as I see Dave right yeah. now. Is that guy who gave me this opportunity when I should not have had this opportunity to, to impact others and right. kind of, you know, help, help the, uh, you know, hopefully New Mexico restaurant scene grow yeah. and, and be uh, a little community like what Restaurant Systems Pro have with their elite group. You yeah. Know? I mean, I love that. And um, I'm telling you, man, right now you opening yourself up and and opening the door to other people, you're going to go further because of it. And that's what I've learned is this, it's the people who are opening themselves up to each other will go further together. And, um, that is one thing that I know to be true in my studies of human nature and human evolution and human psychology, human uh, biology. Like we are packed animals. We, we need each other to go further, to last longer and to survive. So that is, that is the strongest mindset you can have right there. Uh, I love that. Um, and is there anything we didn't discuss today? Something that you think that we needed to discuss? Now's the time to get it out. Um, I, I can't think of anything. I think we, uh, you know, it's been it's been a pleasure and honestly a little starstruck sitting across oh, from man. you as <laughs> the guy that I feel has uh, formed a lot of my viewpoints on on how the restaurant industry should be. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it's just amazing. I'm starstruck and I feel a little bit of imposter syndrome oh, being here right now. Well, uh, you, but do you have imposter syndrome. You own a restaurant. <laughs> I just talk about them, dude. Uh, no. And thank you for helping uh, me realize that my vision is coming true. And my dream is coming true. Um, because you know, that was always the, the, the dream is to, to empower people who were in the position to do something with the knowledge. And I knew that if I can make my world about helping people like you do something by getting access to these minds and these perspectives, then my day will come. And I think my day is yet to come, but I'm still having fun, man. And uh, I love what I do. So thank you for reinforcing it. Um, before we wrap up, I do want to ask you a couple standard questions. Uh, what is one thing you feel or one thing about your business, a core value, a process, a system that is truly uncommon and makes you unstoppable? You know, and I, I don't know if it's necessarily as uncommon uh, being in this group of great restaurateurs here right now, but I think that the key that everyone holds true is, uh, you know, uh, give a shit, care about others, uh, yeah. whether it's your vendors, your third-party delivery drivers, your staff, your guests, um, just 
give a shit and care about people and do what you can to lift others up and it'll come back to you ten, tenfold. 100%. Uh, the mission statement is to change the world by inspiring, empowering, and transforming the industry. So how have you personally transformed the man you are today versus the man you were when you started back in the, the, the what was it, 2012? My young hot doggy yeah. days. Uh, you know, I've... I've really grown an appreciation for uh, learning from those around me and that all you have to do is ask. You know, uh, when I was younger, I was like, oh, man, I, I can't ask that, you know, that operator how they do this or how they do that. They don't care about me. Um, but then I found out all you have to do is reach out to someone. Yeah. And, and the worst they can do is not reply and then reach out to someone else. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the biggest thing is now I'm more comfortable asking questions. And I wish I would have. Uh, been more comfortable growing up and not having that uh, kind of worry of why would they care about me? Because looking back at it, I care about people. Why wouldn't they also care about people? I love that. And uh, this is the last question. It's a doozy. So hang on to your hat. If you had <laughs> the news or you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work and your restaurants would be lost with the departure uh, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? Oh, man, I'm, I'm that guy that uh, thought I should be prepared for this question, and then I wasn't. Uh, the three pieces. I mean, uh, you know, I think I just touched on it and everything we just talked about. Just, just give a shit care yeah. about others. Um, you know, I think that's a big one. Uh, be willing to, to help others and uh, just make yourself available. Yeah. I know uh, after an 80-hour work week or a, a long day where you get your butt kicked, it, it may be annoying when that person comes up and asks for help or how do I do this or do that. But, um, you know, take that time that may, might make that person today or set them on the path to success. And, um, you know, don't, you know don't, don't get in your own head too much about things. Yeah, man. I love today's conversation. Uh, thank you so much. So, you know, the next question before we officially wrap up, um, who do you respect? and admire somebody that if I had them as a guest on the show, you'd be like, I need to listen to that episode. And if you can't think of just one person, you have multiple then drop them on me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm kind going to kind of turn this around a little bit and, uh, I'd, I'd like to see you get interviewed. Oh, uh, man. it's, it's been a while, I think since you've done that. Yeah. Um, and I think having someone else come on in an interview format and ask you, uh, you know, cause you always drop your little knowledge bombs during these interviews, which are great, but I think there'd be a lot of value uh, for your listeners and for everyone, if uh, someone else were to come on and, and ask you a lot of these questions and, and format it in a way that, hey, you want to own your own restaurant, which you talk about, or do your own group or whatever, and, uh, you know, really pick your brain a little bit as, as to where you think you might go. Yeah. I think it's been a while since you've done that, uh, maybe a few years. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I would love to do it. Who would you have interview me? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, man, that... I, you, this is your world. You know the the good <laughs> interviewers. I, I don't know if anyone can top your style and skill, but uh, oh, thank you. Thank you know, you um, may, think about that a little bit. And you're right. I might be due, and I, I'm open to being interviewed. So um, if you're listening to this um, and you have somebody who should be giving me an interview, I'll, I'll try to keep my, my mind open to who I would like to talk to. But uh, I would absolutely, I would absolutely do that. And maybe you should interview me. There we go. Yeah. The Hot Dog Podcast. I'm soon <laughs> <Yeah>. to you. <laughs> uh, this has been a lot of fun. How can we connect if we want to reach out to you directly? Um, if we maybe want to come join your team and work with you and help scale this thing? Or maybe we just have questions about hot dogs in our own city. Yeah. Uh, Matt at UrbanHotDogCompany.com. Um, spell company all out. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Urban Hot Dog Company, Instagram, Urban Hot Dog Company, Fat Franks. Um, I try to monitor those. And uh, if I'm not monitoring them, someone will get you in touch with me but uh i love to answer questions and, and be of use uh whenever i can so don't hesitate to reach out awesome this is episode 1057 so head over to restaurant slash 1057 we'll have a summary of today's discussion as well as any links any tools or services recommended in today's show uh using my links helps so much and thank you for using my links over the years matt i really appreciate that this is where i say there is no questioning you are unstoppable <laughs>